Good evening and welcome, brothers and friends, for joining us for another virtual Masonic education presented by the Rubicon Masonic Society. This episode marks our 21st education series entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry and is the 40th virtual education since we started this trend in 2020. As we all know, to be a brother within our Masonic fraternity is an honor. So let us be mindful to utilize the tools provided to us in our education this evening to help us better understand ourselves and achieve further light in Masonry. For those of you who are returning visitors to our education, thank you very much for coming back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight, we welcome you and we thank you for being with us. First, I would like to recognize the Masonic sponsors who without their support, this virtual education series would not be possible. I would like to first, of course, thank the Rubicon Masonic Society, which is an invitation only private group of master masons located in Lexington, Kentucky. I would like to thank the William O'Ware Lodge of Research chartered in 1965. It is Kentucky's oldest research lodge. And finally, I want to thank Lexington Lodge Number no. 1, chartered in 1788, and is the oldest Masonic Lodge in Kentucky. Alongside worshipful brother Dan Kimball, John Bizak, my name is Brian Evans, past master of Lexington Lodge No. 1, chairman of Rubicon. Again, thank you for joining us this evening, brothers. Let us proceed. Worship brother Alan Martin, will you please do the honors of delivering the opening motion this evening? Uh, brothers and friends, let's pray. Grand architect of the universe, in thy name we have assembled, and in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Grant that the sublime principles of Freemasonry may so subdue every discordant passion within us, so harmonize and enrich our hearts with thy own love and goodness, that this assembly may humbly reflect that order and beauty which reign forever before thy throne. Amen. So mote it be. Thank you, Brother Martin. Brothers and friends, the purpose of our virtual Masonic education is to gather, to assist in the improvement of oneself by establishing a deeper understanding of Freemasonry, of its traditions, its practices, and further cementing our amazing brotherhood of the fraternity for the betterment of mankind. Any opinions expressed during this virtual Masonic education will be those of the presenter only or the participant and do not necessarily reflect the reviews of the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. A full disclaimer can be read and found at rubiconmasoniccociety.com/slash disclaimer. As you all know, brothers, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome and encouraged to pretend to attend and participate. So please be mindful that anything discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. We ask no alcohol, no smoking, no food or foul language permitted during the presentation. There will also be no discussion of politics or religion at any time. Attendees may be removed if not following protocol. Some simple recommendations. We recommend that the attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or your location under your video to identify yourself to others with us this evening. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera. Please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Turn off all other computer programs and eliminate outside distractions. And finally, as always, please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Brothers and friends, tonight's guest speaker is Brother Steve Peterson. He's an officer of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1, and I've had the privilege of seeing this presentation live and in person, and I can assure you that you are in for an outstanding treat. Worship Brother Bizak, will you please do the honors of introducing our presenter this evening? Certainly. Thank you, Brother. Stephen Pedersen is currently serving as conductor, teacher, adjudicator, clinician, and clarinetist, having served, having recently retired as a college band director. He's taught for almost 40 years on the college and high school levels, and he served as director of bands and orchestras and clarinet saxophone professor at the University of Louisiana Monroe the University of Central Arkansas, Kentucky Wesleyan College, and Center College. He completed his undergraduate and graduate work at Wartburg College, magna cum laude, the University of Iowa, and at the University of Kansas in music education, clarinet performance and instrumental conducting, respectively. He was raised Master Mason in 2006 at Lexington Lodge Number no. 1, and he currently serves as an officer in our lodge. 
Brother Peterson, the floor is yours, sir. Brother Peterson, I think you're muted still. There we go. All right, we're good now? We're all set. The floor is yours. Have fun. Teach us something right. special about music. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give a couple of thanks, not only to Brian for helping to set this up, and uh, Brother Jerry Johnson, who's going to be the, the person behind the scenes tonight running the music, because with Zoom, trying to play music at a high level, it presents unique challenges, and Jerry has just been awesome with helping me put this together. So he's going to be behind the scenes. He can't be on the video, so we're chatting as we go. And we're going to kind of keep each other posted on what we're doing. But again, if we could just give a symbolic uh, clap for Brother Jerry. He's just done an outstanding job helping me. So tonight's presentation, I, when I give this particular uh, series of ideas, I normally do this in two sections, uh, music presentation one and two, which I've done at Lexington Lodge now in, in its full. But tonight I've decided with Brian's suggestion is to put them together, move through the first part a little quicker than normal to get to where I think a lot of our brothers will be most interested. And that's the part that deals with the particular composers um, in the classical world that were Masons or, or believed in Masonry and had this connection um, with this brotherhood and kind of how this fits into the historic world of music. And finally, particular composers, their pieces and how all this comes together. So before we start, I'm going to ask a favor to all of our members that are here tonight. What I would ask that you do, and trust me, this is not a test. If everyone would just please, if available, take a clean sheet of paper and some kind of writing utensil, pencil, pen, whatever works well for you. If you... Uh, Work along with me on this. I think you'll find it interesting and a little easier to see where we've been and where we are going. So to get to the point where we talk specifically about Masonic composers, Masonic music, and the classical world, we first have to step back just a little, about 2,000 years, in fact, to see the origins of Western art music or classical music. Uh, I get this question a lot, what is classical music? And what is this strange word that I hear, Western art music? All that means is that it's the history of uh, serious music through Western Europe onto the United States for approximately the last 2,000 years, from the time of the Greeks all the way into the current time. This particular history of music, tonight I'll keep very brief, very broad scope, and in a way that hopefully will help you understand better once we arrive at the Masonic composers. We start with the music in the past 2000 years, obviously has had thousands of different composers, different styles, different approaches, different societies, different listening techniques. In other words, very quickly, we realize that music comes in all shapes and sizes. But the beauty of the history of music, and in fact, all of the arts, is that in spite of all these differences, when you look back 2,000 years, music generally sits, at least symbolically, on one or the other side of um, this graph, so to speak, of what I call the classic side and the romantic side. In particular, I call it the left and the right. And as Brother Brian said, there is absolutely no correlation to politics in this left to right. I assure you of that. So over these 2000 years, music has settled in some way, either on this left side, the classic side, or the right side, the romantic side. And the beauty of this is that even within all of these changes in styles and approaches, that in some way music finds its way to come together, at least in these two 
broad stroke ways. And for those of you out there that love painting and architecture and other arts, what's really fascinating about this is that this approach to the study and history of music applies to art, painting, theater, architecture, sculpture, short stories, novels, all arts assimilate in a similar way, which is basically a classic to romantic, left to right, back and forth. And the last thing that I'll, in a general way, say about this before we break out our uh, little diagram here is that instead of this history of music being linear, as in if I turn this way just briefly, that the history just went on one era, another era, another era, another era. We've gone 500 years, 600 years to get the idea. It really is not a linear path. It's a path of something else of which personally, I think this path works in the best to assimilate and think of it as a large pendulum. And this pendulum swings from left to right to left. And obviously this pendulum moving is taking place over decades and centuries. So to show you how this works, to start to put some errors and to listen to some music, Here's where we get to work together. All right, I'm going to use a marker, another of Brian's great suggestions. Thanks, Brian. That uh, what I'll have you do. All right, the first thing is to draw. Can you see it okay, Brian? Looks great. Okay. A horizontal line across the whole page, the entire page. Then, Draw a vertical line that intersects in the middle. Then uh, short ways up the vertical line, put an X. And for those of you that are artists, feel free to exaggerate and exemplify your skills. I can't, mine will be very basic. Then I'm gonna draw, it almost looks like a face, but it's a large arc from left to right, all the way across the page. You can see that, Brian, okay? Yes, Steve, doing great. All right. And that line is going to symbolically demonstrate and reflect our pendulum. All right, now, when we're on the left side of the graph, obviously here and right side there. So what I would like you to do now is to put six X's, one, two, I'll show you, three, four, five, six. Six X's on the left side of your page above the horizontal line. Did I get that? Excellent. Now on the right side, I want you to put five X's. Two, three, four, five. So that's what it looks like. How's it look, Brian? Looks good. Okay. And that is going to be our basic structure for the rest of the night so you can kind of see where we are and where we're headed. Okay. Right at the top of the left. Right here, put classic. And the top of the right, put romantic. Now, the other part that I want you to write in, I, my magic marker is too big, so I can't really write it, and you probably wouldn't be able to see it anyway. But what I want you to do now is in this quadrant right here, under classic, we're going to write some adjectives, some synonyms, some ways that these particular composers and music uh, find a oneness or a similarity together, right? So these adjectives will all go on the classic side, all right? Let's put less, symmetrical, well-defined, simplistic. Did we say symmetric? Yes. Okay, symmetric. Uh, smaller ensembles. 
shorter pieces. Narrower, narrower range of dynamics. And generally reserved. All right, everybody good on those? Good. Okay. Now, in the right quadrant, right under romantic, we're going to write some adjectives and some synonyms that well, you'll find to be strikingly opposite of the classic. All right, here we go. Larger ensembles. Longer pieces. Asymmetry. Freedom, less restrictions, openness and willingness to try new ideas, and generally more. So now that you've got your page, you see we're about to put some composers and pieces on these X's. This is our pendulum that swings back and forth. And now we have two broad stroke areas of the arts that throughout the past 2000 years have assimilated, come together and worked in almost polar opposites in many ways. Now, before we actually start doing this, remember what I said earlier that this path, and this is gonna be our first one, which I'll tell you these all in just a minute, the Greek times, and it's not gonna be linear it's going to move from left side to the right side, back to the left side, back to the right side, back to the left side. You get the idea. So that we have this symbolic pendulum that moves back and forth through the eras and the ages and brings us back in some ways to where we start. All right. Jerry, we're about to, to take off and get started here. Uh, the first X on your classical side, closest to the middle, if you'll please write Greek. That's the first X closest to the middle on the classic line. And the approximate dates, and again, the historians uh, uh, work in various ways and change the dates, but generally Greek times, we look at it as 600 BC to 100 AD. Jerry and I don't have any specific music from this time because there's really none that we were left with. But we do have an idea of what the arts were like based on two areas, and that's architecture and sculpture. Ar architecture from the Greek times, and remember all our adjectives, clear, precise, symmetrical, ordered, well-defined. It's exactly what you imagine from the Greek times. It's the symmetrical buildings, clearly defined, columns and an ordered number of columns. It's typically when you go to any college campus, that primary building that you see when you first go on or the admissions building or the administration building, they always have a Greek type structure. It gives solidity uh, and um, this classic feel. All right. The other part before we move on is that we have an idea in the Greek times of what this was like related to the arts based on sculpture. I come back to Brother Brian. If we were going to uh, commission a, a wonderful sculpture of Brother Brian's face from the Greek times, it would not, I repeat, not look like Brian. It would only look like one of the gods. In other words, very classic, pure, not really expressive at this point. All right, we're moving on. Now our pendulum is going to swing. And Brian, make sure you tell me you can see it. So we now we're going from the first X on the classic to the first X on the romantic. Yep. Okay. And this first X is Roman. The, the times are approximately 100 AD to 600 AD. Again, Brother Jerry and I don't have any music from this time. But it's generally when we go to architecture and sculpture, we look at some very, very profound differences. And the most obvious in the architectural world 
is in the time of Rome, we've had, we had curvilinear forms, we had color, we had striking contrast, and obviously we all know about these, we added the Colosseums, which were round in structure and really would not have fit well on the classic Greek side. All right, what about sculpture? Sculpture in the Romantic side. Now we go back to Brother Brian. Brother Brian, you're very popular. <laughs> and we've commissioned another sculpture of his uh, head from the Romantic times. Here's the difference. Now the sculpture looks like Brian. It's more expressive, more realistic, and more like Brian. All right, we keep going. Now our pendulum hasn't swung very far, but now it's gonna swing back to the classic side. And now we're going to X number two on the classic side. And we call this time period Ars, A-R-S, Antiqua, A-N-T-I-Q-U-A, Ars Antiqua. Second X to the left on the classic side. The dates we generally reserve for this era is 600 AD to 1300 AD. This is the time of what we would generally consider the Middle Ages, uh, King Arthur. Uh, this is the time of the Romanesque cathedrals, very stark, very uh, basic. And the music we do have, and it's quite profound, and it's music that we call Gregorian chant. And that's what we're gonna listen to here in just a second. What's really fascinating is that for the last probably 10 to 15 years, the most popular CDs purchased, even before um, all of the online aspects, the most popular CDs and even online classical music has been Gregorian chant. So we're ready, Jerry, for our first uh, musical example from Ars Antiqua, Gregorian chant. <laughs> And again, we're, we're going to work through this pretty quickly. Normally in a, my presentation of this, we'd let you listen to longer examples, but tonight we just don't have time. All right, that was Ars Antiqua. Now our pendulum is going to swing back to the right side, the Romantic, and we're going to go to the next available X on the line, and that's the second X to the right on the Romantic. And we call this era Ars Nova, A-R-S, Nova, N-O-V-A. The dates are 1300 to 1400 AD, centers around France, and Ars Nova really just means new music. Now we've added something we did not have in the classic side in the Ars Antiqua or the Middle Ages. We now have what we call secular music. There's two basic kinds of music in music history. Sacred music is music from the church. Secular is from outside the church. So you're gonna hear right away, this is very, very different. This is secular music from the Ars Nova. The composer is Machot, French, 1300 to 1400. Play. I told Lexington Lodge the other night when we were playing this, that that particular instrument you heard is called a shawm. It's like an oboe, only worse. It's very loud and raucous. And so I didn't want you to hear too much of that. But anyway, you can hear right away that's a secular and very, very different, a little more advanced. You can see more of the romantic side tools and techniques are starting to show for. All right, our pendulums at work. We're now here, and the pendulum's now swinging to the third X on the classic side. The third X on the classic side. And we've now reached the Renaissance. A lot of you have studied the Renaissance. You know about it. You studied it in history. You studied it in the arts. The Renaissance, 
uh, dates generally are given 1450 to 1600. And of course the Renaissance is the rebirth humanism and something very, very uh, drastic was changing from the Ars Nova. Another fascinating part that I, I find just incredibly striking is that this particular Renaissance piece that we're about to hear mirrors a return to Greek times. It doesn't mirror a return to Roman. It doesn't mirror a return to Ars Nova. It mirrors a return to the uh, type of music composer styles on the classic side. In other words, it stays at home, so to speak. All right, this particular Renaissance piece is quite striking in that now we have more than one voice, call it polytonality, and you'll hear some striking and wonderful sounds. This is a work by Josquin Dupre. Play. Mm -hmm. It's really, really wonderful and striking music. Uh, for anyone at the end that wants the particular piece, Jerry and I can give you that. It's just a beautiful, beautiful piece. All right, that's a Renaissance. Now our pendulum swings back. We go back to the Romantic side. And now from the Renaissance, we, yeah, we are now in the Classic side. Whoop. From the Renaissance, we're now moving to Baroque. All right. Third X on the right, Baroque dates are 1600 to 1750, and the Baroque era fits so wonderfully on the Romantic side. It exemplifies in architecture, sculpture, and music in every way, pure and wonderful exaggeration, ornamentation. Uh, for those of you that have been to Europe and seen some of these Baroque cathedrals, you walk in and you're just overwhelmed and stunned by the ornaments, the color, and the beauty of all of this. Uh, this particular era, again, 1600 to 1750, 1750, is represented by J.S. Bach. And the piece that we've chosen for tonight is the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, uh, J.S. Bach, lots of ornamentation, a perfect example of the right side. Play, Jerry. And that's the one, one of, one of the brothers at Lexington Lodge had been to a big cathedral in Europe and they happened to walk in and the organist from the church just happened to be playing the Toccata Fugue in D minor. And he said, everyone sat down and cried for the eight or nine minutes. And it, it's a spectacular piece. But again, that just represents highly on the romantic side. All right, our pendulum swings back. We're now on X, one, two, three, four. Make sure I'm on the right one, Brian. One, two, three, four, correct? Correct. Okay. So now on that side, this particular era is called the classical side, not to be confused with the classic in the large sense. Uh, the dates of this would be 1750 to 1825. And it is almost polar opposite to the romantic music of Bach. This classic world is represented by one of our greatest composers, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And this particular piece that I've chosen, uh, no, no great surprise, I'm a clarinetist and woodwind player, and so I chose the, the great Mozart clarinet concerto, just the beginning of the second movement. You've probably heard it in lots of movies. I remember it in the movie called Out of Africa and just lots of other movies. So Jerry, play Mozart clarinet concerto.
Jerry? Jerry knows that tears my heart out to stop at that point on that particular piece because I love it so much. But it, it's generally known as maybe the greatest classical work of all times. If you ever get a chance to listen to that Mozart clarinet concerto, it's absolutely stunning. It, there's hardly any piece better that represents all of these synonyms and areas and styles on the classic side than that Mozart clarinet concerto. All right, now we move to a special X that's exactly in the middle. It's the one that I have you put on the vertical line just above the center line. That particular X goes to Beethoven. And the reason that we write Beethoven on that X is because Beethoven was a unique composer and that he basically pulled the classic world by the force of his creativity to the romantic side. It's a quite spectacular career and very few composers could do what he did again in transitioning and pulling this all the way to the other side. Brother Alan from our lodge and I were talking about how do we move this pendulum, which we'll talk more about later, but Beethoven was a mover when it came to the pendulum. He was able to pull that classic to romantic. Beethoven composed nine symphonies. We're going to just to listen to just a little bit. Oh, sorry, the date. Uh, Beethoven's dates, he lived across the 1800. And uh, so we'll just put 1800 for Beethoven. He composed nine symphonies. We're going to listen to a little bit of the ninth. This symphony is the only one with full orchestra, choir, full choirs, and solos. The ending is quite spectacular and uses Ode to Joy. Go, Jerry. Beethoven 9. And again, it's just a spectacular ending. I would encourage anyone that has any interest in this, listen to the end of that. It's, it's just completely uplifting. At the time of this and earlier in Beethoven's career, he was completely deaf. And they said he went to the rehearsals for the Ninth Symphony, put his hands on the stage and just felt the vibrations because he couldn't hear any sound that was coming from the orchestra. All right, now we are fully, the pendulum has moved us from Mozart to Beethoven. The pendulum continues to go and moves towards the second to last X. And this is now um, the Romantic era, 1825 to 1900. And this brings us to the Romantic era at its absolute height. The biggest groups, the longest pieces, the most dramatic, the most expressive, the most, 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 more, 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 more. It's like adding on, adding on, adding on to the point of arriving at this point. So this one, two, three, fourth X, romantic, 1825 to 1900, the composer you're going to listen to is Mahler, M-A-H-L-E-R. Mahler also wrote nine symphonies, and we're going to listen just a little bit to the end of the eight. It's entitled Symphony of a Thousand because Mahler wanted a huge orchestra, twice the size of normal. He wanted four choirs, soloist, pipe organ, Brass up in the balcony. In other words, the absolute epitome of the romantic side. Bigger, more, longer. This particular piece is over an hour and a half long. Very, very different than one of the Mozart symphonies that might be 15 to 20 minutes. So here we go. The end of Mahler's eighth symphony, Romanticism at its height. Go, Jerry. <laughs> show you uh, everyone thought that was the ending that was not the ending 
that was one of the, the ways and techniques that a romantic composer would say, it might be the ending. No, let's do it one more time, one more ending. They might have 10 endings before they get to the real ending. Again, that more, 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 more. All right, our pendulum swings back from the romantic side all the way over to X, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this is Impressionism. We'll put around 1900. This is the style of music that followed and mimicked Impressionism in the arts. Uh, artists like Monet, Manet, Renoir, Degas, uh, painters who had just kind of images and kind of hazy look. And you'll hear this. This particular piece is by Debussy, French composer called Afternoon of a Fawn. On the left side, classical. And go, Jerry. Again, you get the idea of how much less in every way that is as far as a quiet and expressive than that huge Mahler symphony. All right, here we go. Our pendulum swings back to the other side. And now we should be at the final X on the right side. And we leave this X for the 20th century. The greatest 20th century composer in um, Western art music is Stravinsky. Wrote numerous ballets. And we're going to listen just a little bit to Right at Spring. And you'll hear right away, wow, more, 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 more notes, more rhythms, extremely complex and difficult. Go, Jerry, Stravinsky. You can hear how different that is, striking what we call dissonant, where two notes are put together like a, a G and a G sharp, so that it becomes very harsh and brittle on our ears. And that was just that tremendous dissonance that we added in the 20th century. Steve, All right, if you follow, quick, what was the style of music that one you displayed? Did you say? Oh, we just call it 20th century. Just 20th century. Okay. Yeah, it's just called 20th century music. We're too close to it to really kind of assimilate a big style. There were numerous styles within it, expressionism and serialism and neo-romanticism, but just generally, we just call it 20th century. Okay. All right, we should have one X left on your left side, way over on the left side of the page if you've done everything correctly, hopefully you have. And all you're gonna do now is right above that, uh, classic jazz slash marches. Classic jazz slash marches. Brian, do we have all our X's filled out? How's that look? Not bad. Yeah, that's good. You're a little sloppy. Uh, sorry. Yeah, he did a good job. So again, our pendulum has taken us from left to right through the past 2000 years and allowed us to put some ideas and thoughts behind these different styles and pieces. Again, what's so dramatic and really, really interesting is that if this particular, um, X on the left side, which is Mozart. If he looks back to get inspiration, he'll normally look back to Ars Antiqua or Renaissance. Generally, they stay on that side. If Mahler looks back on the right side, he's generally going to look back maybe to Bach or maybe even Beethoven. So they tend to stay together because those ideas are similar. And remember, it works for all of the arts. All right, now we have two very, very important questions for us as Masons that we're about to answer and then have some discussion to talk about. One is related to Masonic order, studies, writings. Could we make an assumption or could we make a belief and back it up that Masonry and the order of Masonry might fit better as far as the music to one side or the other? In other words, do those composers who were Masons and wrote Masonic music or music that was just 
uh, written as them as a Mason, did it seem to connect better, find a home better on one of these sides? The answer to the question is yes, but I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Let's go on to question two. So if that answer is correct, and we choose one side or the other, either the classic or the romantic that seems to find a home for Masons in the sense of composers, then would there be a composer then that stands out above even that on that side that probably is one of the most important composers and one that's studied by Masons? And again, I think the answer to that question is yes. We'll come back to it in a minute. All right. So now instead of taking the time to show you where all these composers that are Masons, I'm just gonna kind of give you about 15, tell you where they sit on our chart, and then we'll talk about how and what does that seem to me. All right, here we go. Mozart, Haydn, Pleo, Rousseau, and J.C. Bach, a son of J.S. Bach. All of those composers, and I can give those to you in the end if you, you want those again, all of those composers were Masons, wrote Masonic music, were a part of Masonry. It was an important part of their compositions and they all live in the classical world right here. They were in that period of Mozart, in the period of um, 1750 to 1825, maybe just a little further, okay? All right, let's go on. I'll give you two more composers. Mendelssohn and Beethoven. And where do they sit on our graph? Mendelssohn was friends uh, symbolically and as a composition with Beethoven. They were in this world of somewhere in between. They were based in the classics, but moving in some way towards romanticism. Okay, now let's go all the way over to the right and I'll give you two composers who were Masons and had important roles in Masonry and they were in the Romantic era. They were uh, Franz Liszt and Sibelius. All right. So right now you can kind of see that the classic side has a little bit of an edge as far as the number of composers, the importance. But here's the slam dunk. Here's the Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Shaquille O'Neal slam dunk that puts us over to the classic side. Remember this one X we left right here? We said that was for classic jazz and marches in the 20th century. You know these particular composers. These were also Masons and important classical jazz composers. Count Basie, Irving Berlin, Duke Ellington, George Gershwin. They wrote classic and jazz music and brought the music together. Then two marches that were all march composers that were also Masons, Carl King from Iowa and John Philip Sousa. So when you add those, I guess, six composers, I think it's pretty clear that there seems to be something happening a little more profoundly on the classic side related, related to these Masonic composers than the Romantic side. Now, please, before any of you uh, raise your hand or throw, throw something at the screen, we're not talking about good or bad, right or wrong, well, what about Mahler? He's my favorite composer. He's my favorite composer too. So it's not right or wrong, good or bad. It's only, is there a connection with classical Masonic composers on one side of our pendulum or the other? And in my humble opinion, I think again that the answer is yes, and it's the classic side. One of the brothers and I were talking about it after the presentation uh, this week, and he said, you know, when I think about it, if you talk about those adjectives or synonyms on the classic side, uh, let me repeat some of them where you can look at yours and think about it in a Masonic way. Order, symmetry, uh, perfection, definition, less, workable, not as extreme. So I think even in the world of music, you could make a case that there's something going on that connects this a little bit stronger. Again, it has nothing to do with good, bad, right, or wrong. Um, in a fascinating way that I would urge those of you that have an interest, 
that if you want to take a step further in and hear really what I mean when we talk about Masonic music and the two sides of the pendulum, Mozart composed a very, very famous Masonic funeral piece. It's called uh, Masonic Funeral Music, Kirkel or, or Catalog Number 477. And it's quite striking and incredibly classical. Sibelius, over here in the Romantic world, wrote one that was called Funeral Music. And it is so different, it's hard to imagine anything more directly contrast. But it, it shows this classic romantic left, right, and the order of these. All right, so if we assume then that the classic side has a little more of a stronger connection to Masonic classical composers and Masonic music, then the next obvious question would be, well then is there a superstar composer who was a Mason, who we study as a brilliant composer and who we study as a Mason. And I know a lot of you are raising your hand, you've got the answer and you're probably correct. I think most uh, historians or musicologists and Masons when asked that question, they would respond and answer with Mozart. Uh, Mozart lived a very short life, 35 years. He died in 1791, he became a master mason. He was raised in 1785. So it was only his last six years that he was a mason. But the part that is stunningly brilliant is those last six years for Mozart were incredibly poignant and prophetic. And he wrote a lot of music in that time. He wrote the magic flute, which we're about to talk about. He wrote many symphonies and he wrote the great clarinet concerto that we listened to a little bit earlier. Uh, so Mozart was, was raised to a master mason in 1785. Most of Mozart's friends and colleagues were masons. Most of his relatives were masons. He even convinced his father to become a mason. And here's the one that when I read this, um, the first time I was just blown away because it was so amazing. The other great superstar composer from the classic era was Franz Joseph Haydn. Mozart was living in around Vienna. Haydn was in Esterhazy, Austria. And Mozart convinced Haydn to become a Mason. Mozart traveled before he died and went to the raising of Haydn as Master Mason, which I think is just stunning. These two incredibly important composers in classical music, not only were both Masons, but Mozart convinced Haydn to become a Mason. So Mozart's connections with Masonry, personally, friends, relatives, were very, very strong. Mozart felt in a most convincing way that Masonic order and the beauty of music led to enlightenment. And of course, as Masons, one of our goals is to reach through uh, and past despair, darkness, we find light. Mozart called it enlightenment, and he felt very, very strongly that with the power and beauty of music, then that could truly happen. So that's why I chose Mozart as that representative, brilliant composer and Mason. So Jerry and I now are about to play some pieces from Masonic composers, and particular, let me check my time here, and particularly uh, some of Mozart and Haydn. So the, the first piece that I chose, because I think most Masons that have studied music and studied masonry at some point have read or listened or studied something about Mozart's great opera, The Magic Flute. And The Magic Flute is a particularly a brilliant opera just in its musical sense, but when you add the Masonic aspects, it becomes something stunning in a way that's almost hard to comprehend. And it's by no coincidence, uh, Mozart intended that, and Mozart and his, and his librettist intended that. Um, Mozart was commissioned to write this work, and the person that wrote the libretto or the text was also a friend of Mozart and a Mason. So the composer and the person that wrote the story were both Masons. All right, 
Very quickly, I think I can do this in 30 seconds. Here's the story of the magic flute by uh, Mozart. Our hero, Kimono, is an Egyptian prince and is in any good dramatic opera, he's on a life journey. He ends up in a foreign land. He gets chased by a serpent monster. Again, you got to have that in opera. And this serpent monster is certain to kill him. He's saved by three women who are actually ladies in waiting for the great queen of the night, who's a great important person in this world of Mozart. They save him from the serpent monster and immediately show him a picture of Pomona, who's the daughter of queen of the night. They take him to the queen of the night and she says, as is any great opera, opera, my daughter has been kidnapped. Can you please bring her back to me? Tomono says, yes, I will do that. I'm already in love with her. I've seen her picture. And she says, I'm gonna help you on this life journey to find her and bring her back. And I'm gonna give you some magical uh, tools and a magic flute. And our hero says, I would love to play the flute. And she said, it will guide and keep you safe through your journey. So he takes the magic flute and throughout the opera, again, we don't have time tonight, but it is full of uh, symbology. Uh, I'm sorry, it's full of symbols. It's full of ritual. It's full in a very direct way to what we um, live in and exhibit with as Masons. Um, towards the end of the opera, our hero even needs to go through, this will sound familiar, in this case, four instead of three, but he has to go through four tests, earth, wind, fire, and water. And he has to go through these to survive. His love, Pomona, says, I will go with you, hero, whatever happens. He gets to the point of getting ready to try and get through these trials and tribulations and tests. And guess how he gets through? He plays his magic flute. Happy ending. He gets through, he brings her back safely and achieves his goals. The fascinating part again is all of the underlying symbols deal almost directly with Masonic order, writings, ritual, symbols again. It, it, it's really, really quite striking. Um, for those of you that are interested, the best book that I know on this subject, if, if you love opera and you want to grab this by the tail and find out all of what's going on in this, this Chaley book called uh, Magic Flute Unveiled is really, really good. The whole thing is about magic flute and is quite amazing. So that gives you just a, a little bit of that. And now we're going to play the beginning of the Magic Flute Overture, which gives us a little idea of, of the actual piece. Go, Jerry. Jerry is pausing us at this particular point. I just want to make a couple of comments. Even on the opening, it's full of symbols. You hear references to the three knock. There's all sorts of symbols in the temple. And again, all sorts of things that we just don't have time for tonight. But we're going to listen to just another 10 seconds of the slow intro into the fast section, which shows the spirit of the journey that Tomono is on for this opera. Go, Jerry. Okay. 
again for time, we're going to wrap these quickly. And now we're going to play, Jerry and I are going to do just a little bit of one of the great arias in opera, and that's the Queen of the Night aria. Uh, it will be, will be difficult to understand what she says in German, but basically what she's saying is that she wants a helper to assassinate her rival. So it's really quite dark, and so we're going to listen just a little bit of the Queen of the Night aria. Go, Jerry. And I would highly recommend for any of you that have an interest in seeing an opera or in particularly the Magic Flute, which by the way, is on live this weekend at UK at the Opera House, is because of the nature of languages and the way operas are written. Anytime that you would go to an opera, I would highly recommend calling as I did today and find out how they're presenting it in what language, if they're doing what they call super titles, and uh, I found out that for the Magic Flute this weekend, the good news is they are singing in the original German, but they'll have what they call super titles up above the stage in English. And the short bit of dialogue will be in English for those that are going with me and uh, Brother Darren to the opera this weekend. All right, quickly, uh, Mozart wrote a piece when two of his close Masonic friends died. It's called Masonic Funeral Music, again, for those of you that are writing it down, it's Kirkle or catalog number 477. It's stunningly beautiful. Artistically and creative, creativity is off the charts. And uh, we'll listen just a little. And then towards the end, we'll listen to the ending after some questions. So this is beginning, Jerry. Again, it tears my heart out to have to stop, but we really, really do on that particular piece for a time. We're going to hear a little bit at the ending. I never forget as an undergrad asking my college band director what makes Mozart so great. And he thought for a minute and he said, what makes Mozart so great is that every note is perfect. You can't really go back and change what Mozart has written. And it's one of the brilliant creative minds of the past 2000 years. All right, we're listening to just a little bit of Mozart's friend who he encouraged to become a Mason, uh, Joseph Haydn, again, lived in Esterhazy. He wrote 104 symphonies. We're gonna listen to just a little bit of the surprise symphony, number 94, it's very short. And uh, Haydn was always dismayed by all his rich court connoisseurs that would fall asleep when he played his symphonies. And so he gave him a surprise, called it surprise symphony. Go Jerry. Okay, good, Jane. So, and Haydn uh, it oftentimes would encourage the orchestra to play that really, really loudly. He, he really wanted to wake them up and thought they were probably already asleep after just two praises. So that was Haydn. Uh, Jerry, let's skip the Mendelssohn because of time. And one of our great composers of the 20th century who incorporated jazz and classical was George Gershwin. Probably the most famous piece of the 20th century was Rhapsody in Blue. And Again, a Masonic composer. So we'll play after Jerry gets this, just a little bit of Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin.
Yeah, Jay. Again, a lot of you have heard it. It's actually a classical uh, piano concerto with wind band or orchestra. Just loads of fun and just one of our great, great pieces of the 20th century. So you can see how the composers in the world of classical music that have a Masonic background seem to find this home on the classic side, led by Mozart, stunning work through opera, funeral music, and many, many other pieces that we don't have time tonight that seem to fit, symbolize, and work well with what we strive for in masonry. Um, one other quick point, and then I think uh, the goal, Brother Brian, was to finish with this part by eight. I think we're pretty close, and then we'll have some questions and discussion. Uh, but I wanted to mention one other thing because a brother asked me this the other night. When I go to listen to opera, what kinds of opera are there in addition to just those on the classic side and those on the romantic side? Because it seems kind of, kind of far-fetched opera. And I said, that's a great question. There are basically three general types of opera that could exist on either side. One is the opera represented by the great composer, Italian composer Puccini, and it's where he takes the common man who does great things, gives up his life, and raises him up to almost a godlike status. The second type is this Mozart, a magic flute. It's a fairy tale. And the third is represented by Wagner from the late 19th century. And what he did was the opposite of Puccini. He went to the heavens, took the gods, and brought them down to earth so that it was uh, operas about the gods. Uh, I just wanted to add that because I thought about that too. So that's our classic to romantic pendulum world and how masonry fits in. I think we can go from there, Brian. Outstanding, brother. Let's give uh, let's give our presenter another one of those round of applauses. <laughs> really great job, really great job. And it's so difficult, and you did such an outstanding job to give us the visual as well as the um, the audible sensation of everything that you taught. To do that over Zoom is very challenging, and I think you did a fantastic job. So thank, thank you, you for accommodating to do that. So brothers, uh, let's go ahead and open it up now for questions. Um, so the floor is open for discussion. I'll start with a couple of them, of them, and then hopefully everyone can uh, can jump in and, and share their comments or questions. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and I, I guess my first one is going to and discussing the Greek and Roman era. So mm -hmm. obviously there's no music to pull from, um, but what type of instruments may have been found? What type of music do you think there was? And, and how was music influential in that time period or those time periods, do you think, as a historian of music? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really, really, really great question. We do know some of those instruments. It's just we don't have any particular examples of them. But we know they had drums of varying types to bring in the armies, to bring in the court, celebratory kind of instruments. When they, we know they had some kinds of brass bugle kinds of, um, again, to bring in the forces. They, we know they had something, and we know they had some kinds of uh, a sham type instrument that, that seemed to produce sounds, you know, like, like we would think of a sham or an oboe. So they had kind of early uh, representations of these different instruments, but I would have to say heavy drums, you know, heavy kind of some kind of brass instruments, um, but nothing that we know for sure because we, we just don't have any particular, you know, here's the piece they played, here's the piece that they played. Sure. But pretty much kind of what you would imagine that they could have at that point. Sure, okay. Um, I asked you this when you presented live at Lodge. I said, how did the composers come up with their pieces? Did they pick up an instrument and start playing and, and find the the tune that resonated with them for that song in their head, or would they sit down with a pen and paper first and start writing what they thought the composition would be or a combination of both? What was the style of most of these composers? Right. Yeah, again, that, that question is one that historians look at a lot because they're trying to dive into the creativity process. Yeah, absolutely. And I would have to say, I'll give you a couple of examples. On the one side, we go back to Mozart. And Mozart would have been what you alluded to. He was the composer that it just seemed to come out of him without any type of uh, work. Almost like in the, the movie Amadeus, it came from God straight to Mozart and he wrote down. 
So for Mozart, it was a process of, it seemed to be there, at least in initial stages, and it was a fairly direct process to put it on the page. It's common in, the, in his writings that he would often ask his wife, honey, please, can you bring the kids in or, or tell me a story about today? Try and make this composition a, a challenge for me tonight to try and keep him do, thinking of something else even while he was writing. Um, but there, then here's the opposite. There are numerous, numerous 20th century composers of which Stravinsky was one that did a lot of edits, would write on the piano, do edits. Uh, Leonard Bernstein, they said, when he wrote West Side Story, Our Town, some of these great pieces that Bernstein wrote, he did a lot, he played them on the piano. He'd write it on the score, do edits, keep working on it, you know, keep going back and forth. So to answer the question, Brian, it's really both mm -hmm. and, and wide extremes of how that comes through from their creative process. Okay. I'm not a musician, but I would assume nowadays, you know, a lot of musicians and artists pick up a guitar and just start strumming to yeah. find the song yeah. with their tune in their head. So I, it's fascinating. Uh, brothers and friends, if you guys have any questions, please enter it in the chat or even better, raise your virtual hand. I'll call on you and we can uh, we can discuss it live. Uh, if we have any musicians on with us tonight, would love to get your input, take comments, questions uh, on this presentation. Uh, music being one of the seven liberal arts and sciences, this is very important to Freemasonry and our brotherhood. Um, how long did it typically take for a musician to come up with a composition, uh, Steve? Any yeah. idea? Yeah, I, I think, again, it, it varies wild, wildly. Um, like Mahler, who would write these extensive pieces that might be an hour and a half long, you know, he might take six to nine months for a year okay. to, to write it. Whereas Mozart, you know, he, he could maybe write an opera in a couple of weeks. Um, so it, it really varied on the style and the type of the composer. Um, and, and some composers would, will write a piece and come back to it in five years or 10 years. Um, some composers will write it and say, I'm done. I'm never coming back. That's, you get what you get. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, it really, really varies. Okay. And you even look, uh, a great example, Mozart in his creative world wrote 41 symphonies and his friend Joseph Haydn wrote 104. So even in that world, you know, they were writing differently. So. Were these composers very popular for their time, similar to how artists are in our time? And what, what did that look like from a public perception? Some, it, it very wildly. Another a great example is Mozart and Haydn. We'll stay with them. Mm -hmm. Mozart mm -hmm. lived 35 years and he wanted to live only on his creative process. In other words, by commissions. The, the famed court producer would commission him to write an opera, um, but he did not want to work for anyone because he didn't want to be tied to writing things he didn't want to write. So he, did, he lived a life of poverty, basically, and wrote only what he wanted to by commissions. Whereas Haydn was employed by the Count Esterhazy in Austria, and he had to write what the Count wanted. But he had a full-time employment, and he wrote and lived a long life to mid-70s, so again, there's very, very different approaches. They could either get a commission, they could work for someone. Uh, J.S. Bach worked as a church composer, received a salary, and wrote church music. Um, today in the 20th century, we have composers that work for universities. They write for symphonies. The composer is always looking for a way to make money and survive as a composer. Hmm, interesting. So, so obviously they didn't have CDs or MP3s and things of that nature. How did their music spread? And, and how did other, uh, how, how did the public experience the music when they might be so far away from a composer? Another great question. Uh, it depends on the era, it depends on the time, but if they didn't hear it live, or if they did hear it live, it probably would have been in a court setting. It would have been in a church setting or possibly a community setting. But generally throughout early history, uh, the, the court and the church. Beethoven made a strong decision in his life that he wanted to take music from that, what he thought was archaic way, and he wanted to get music to the masses. He wanted to be able to present his Ninth Symphony for the people of the town. But that, that was a difficult process because of money and how do you pay for it? 
Um, but eventually, of course, that happened in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, then how did it travel? If you couldn't hear it live, uh, you heard it by letters, you heard it by travels, you heard it by other teachers, you heard it by, in other words, word of mouth, or if you went to a university, you studied at a church, those were the key areas that you could listen to great music from, uh, let's say, the Renaissance, Baroque, classical, early part of the Romantic would have been the church, the court, um, and those kind of areas. That are so would other musicians be able to play a piece from one of these composers as similar to maybe a cover band style? Is that how it, is that how it played out? Yes, in some ways. In other words, if Liszt wrote great piano concertos, you know, Rubinstein might play those okay. or somebody else might conduct it. They would put it on a concert. But again, it's important to kind of remember that this concert setting that we have today of going to a concert that we choose, paying money, filling this area, really happened after Beethoven. It really didn't happen until the mid end of the 19th century. And before that, it was primarily church and court. But absolutely, they would play other people's music. Um, And it's a fascinating point you remind me of, Ryan, that even in the time of Bach, it was there were no copyrights. And so it was it was considered an honor if Bach stole the melody from uh, um, somebody in the Renaissance, Josquin. Josquin would have been honored if he stole the melody. Today with copyrights, no, 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 you can't steal my melody. Right. But but back then that connection was please do, we'd love to have you play my melody. Yeah. More of a compliment. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat by Jim Matthews. I'm not sure if you're able to read it, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. The history that I know is that Mozart was influenced by Bach, especially his quartets, and Beethoven was influenced by Mozart. Even when, even went to Vienna to apprentice under him, but there's no record whether they actually met. Is he correct on his history? Yeah, I think that I've read that same uh, bit of history, that there's no actual, did they meet at this particular time? But he brings up a great point. And uh, tell me the person's name again that asked the question. Jim Matthews. He's an entered apprentice. Okay, Jim. It's a great question. And what's really fascinating about your question is you basically have called out, probably knowingly, the generally considered the three greatest classical composers of the last 2,000 years. And what's fascinating about it, again, Mm -hmm. at least in my opinion, Mozart sets on the classic side, Beethoven sets in the middle, and Bach sets on the romantic side. Um, They did know of the other's music, and there was crossing over. If they heard it, if they could get, they get a copy of the score. Absolutely, there was connection with these composers. Just like we talked, Mozart and Haydn were friends, and he convinced Haydn to become a Mason. Yeah, absolutely. Brother Jim, do you want to elaborate on that question or comment at all? Says he's classically trained and and loves the Baroque period. Jim, you're welcome to unmute yourself and make any additional comments you'd like. Uh, No, I I was just, uh, I apologize for my attire. I'm a long haul truck driver. So, um, (laughs) but... (laughs) Um, No, I I actually absolutely love the Baroque period. I was trained on violin when I was younger, um, about six years old when I started uh, learning on violin. Um, And my favorite is Bach, especially his cello concertos. I love Mm -hmm. listening to Edgar Meyer because I was a double bassist as well. Uh, And Edgar Meyer plays his double um, Bach solo concertos for cello. Um, on double bass. He actually redesigned the double bass in order to play it, and it gives a much deeper resonating sound. I just absolutely love it. So I was just making sure that my history was correct on that and the influences that they had. So Yeah. Hey, I would say too, uh, uh, you and I would be great friends because I'm a big Bach fan, and a lot of musicologists and musicians that feel if you had to pick between Mozart, Beethoven, and Bach, um, or in all the other composers, there's a lot of musicians that would pick Bach as maybe the greatest composer. Of course, it's up for subjective debate, but Bach certainly was a 
groundbreaking composer. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate your comments. Thanks for joining us. Brothers, any other comments from the floor? I'll have to start calling on some of you guys, which, uh, there we go. Hey, Brian. Yes. I'm going to ask a question that Alan, Brother Alan asked from our lodge the other night, and it was just a superb question. Alan, are you still on there somewhere? I saw uh, him earlier. I am here. I'm still here. It's okay that I uh, bring you up in this, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Alan asked the, the, the million dollar question, what causes this symbolic pendulum to move? Good question. And it's, it's the question that musicologists study because they wanna determine how the arts change through society, what causes the arts to change, and can we predict this? So it was, it was an awesome question. And so Alan and I talked about it a little bit, and there's really three big picture ways that this pendulum again, moves, classic, romantic, romantic, classic. And we think that the first way obviously is the composer. That the composer with their creative force and genius find a way to move this. And here's a couple examples. Mozart took the classic era and moved it as far as almost humanly possible to the edge of the classical world such that it had to go somewhere else. Bach did the same thing in the Baroque. He moved it almost to the point of no one, there was nothing really left to compose in the Baroque era and it caused the pendulum to swing back. Beethoven did something different. He grabbed the classical, loved it, moved it and pushed it towards the romantic. So composers can do that. Now the second one is society itself. Society can find a way to react and to move from um, what they've lived through and find ways to start nudging this, as in, we've heard enough of that. I don't want to listen to Schoenberg's 12-tone dissonant music. They start pushing away. They don't go to concerts. So society, in its way, can push and pull. And then the third way, which is what Alan was talking about, remember, Alan was events. We talked about events that might push arts one way or the other, the pendulum such as the uh, atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After that particular event, there were a, 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 a relish of composers that wrote music in direct reaction to it that were significantly striking and dissonant, very difficult to understand, but they were trying to present what had just happened in a way. Another would be the Industrial Revolution, could be the plague in Europe, but again, that was Alan's question. I thought it was a great question. And I'd say composer, society, and events. Thanks, Alan. Yep, great question. Bruce, did you have a question? Well, first, uh, I'm going to read what I wrote to you. Uh, and that was, uh, Steve, I really wish when I was in college, I had been offered a course in music like this as it might have helped me to appreciate all music more. As it was in my sophomore year, I had neighbors that were into hard rock. And I talked to a friend and he suggested organ music to me. And that grounded it out. <laughs> so it was very helpful from that point of view. The uh, comment I was gonna make is I'm, I sing in, two choirs and I sing in uh, Scottish Rite Choir here in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Cincinnati. And um, we're the only law or uh, only valley in the Northern Masonic jurisdiction that has female choir members. They cannot see the stage. They stay outside where we're at most of the time, but it really makes a lot more, just the emotions and everything when the degrees are being done to have the music being played. You know, and I, I experienced the music for Masonic degrees once, uh, back my first year, a friend, that I was working with invited me to his lodge and uh, it really 
in some ways made it, it, it more interesting. It made, definitely made it a little longer, mm -hmm. but I think it ends lends so much more to the degree to have the music, you know, played sometimes. Um, so, you know, it, yeah. it was it was interesting. A couple of years ago, we had somebody that was just playing like a electric piano, and some of the things he chose as walking music <laughs> were funny, and that so. But thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And uh, hey, Brian, he reminded me of something. If I can just throw it in, that I wanted to be sure and say, particularly for those that might be going to see the Magic Flute, or have seen it, or have an interest in it, that the the actual Magic Flute I wanted to add is that some Masons and some historians feel that the Magic Flute itself, the instrument. Mozart intended it to be a symbol for masonry. Not only just a symbol for finding a way through you know, this operatic turmoil, but that he may have actually said that the entire opera is based on masonry in the sense of the magic flute will help Tomono get through these trials and find his love and everything that he wants. And it's gonna happen because of masonry which in effect could be the magic flute. Interesting. So is some of that, uh, is what is written in that book that you shared, the magic flute unveiled? Yes. Is that correct? And it's, the, the book is really designed for somebody who loves music and wants the particular, I mean, he goes through every, every aria and every act and every scene, tells you what happened and how it ties in with masonry. It's very, very detailed, but just really, really quite stunning. Right. Okay, Brother Bruce, you bring up a good point. Does anybody here, and I know some of you do, if you attend Lexington, uh, use music in their lodge? If you have music play in your lodge, maybe just put it in the chat. I'd be curious to know if you do. If you don't, I would strongly recommend it. It uh, enhances the Masonic experience of just being together as brothers in, a, in an incredible way. Uh, Worst Brother Bizak, I'm going to give you a word in a minute, but you always have said that, um, I forget what your exact quote is, but music softens the heart uh, in a way that nothing else truly can. So do you have any comments tonight on our presentation? Uh, well, I do believe it does soften the heart, but uh, Steve, it, it, excellent, excellent presentation and masterfully presented. Thank you very much for your time and uh, effort to put this together. Uh, can we look forward to a part three? sometime in the future in Lodge that maybe covers the 20 and 21st century. Yeah, I, I think that that could happen and uh, that, that would probably be fun, yeah. We'll hold you to it. <laughs> Thank you again, Steve. Where's Brother uh, Dan Kimball? Any comments, questions you'd like to make tonight for our presenter? A quick question, I mean, it, it kind of follows up on what uh, Worshipful Brother Bizak just said. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for a, a, a very enjoyable presentation, Brother Peterson. Um, going back to your axis of, of the different periods, are we still in the 20th century period or have we moved to a new period? Oh, another great question. The way I would answer that is we don't know. If we ask a musicologist or a historian, they would say that they can't define it yet. We're too close to it. But, but I will say this, that having studied and listened to 20th century music for the last 40 years, well, I should say more than that, I personally find that what's happening in the 20th century is this pendulum that before may have taken 100 years to move to the next era or 500 years or 125 years. I think what's actually happening is this pendulum is moving very fast. And you know, with the change in the 20th century, and subsequently, uh, all of these things are happening so fast that we just, we, we haven't been able to step back and really look at it. And so even, even composers like Stravinsky in the 20th century had a classic side and a romantic side, came back to a classic side. Schoenberg, same thing, he had a classic side, romantic, came back. And so that I think the whole century is somewhat that. And at the end of this 20th century, 21st century, 
I think overall, though, we've returned to more romantic music. Great. Uh, Worst brother Chad Lasik, I'm going to call on you in one moment, but um, Steve, this has been great. If you, uh, I know a lot of brothers would like to have access to some of these songs, maybe even mm -hmm. some notes, some notes summary, summarizing what you've gone through a little bit here. Um, let's connect afterward and make sure that we can share some of that information with other brothers, if you don't mind. Hey, Brian, can we still, as we close and leave after you guys are finished, uh, Jerry's got just the end of the Masonic funeral music ready to go. Yep, absolutely. We will do that at the very end. Absolutely. Okay. So let's do one more comment. Uh, Worship Brother Chad Lasik, you just mentioned that you play actually music in your lodge. Would, would you like to elaborate on that, please? Certainly, Worshipful. So as, as all of us know, uh, the opening and closing portion of our ritual, there are some dead spaces where the deacons are performing their duties, etc. And I have for about 10 years now, uh, very simply gotten a, a beautiful playlist of classical music that we have Bluetoothed through our, our speakers in the lodge. And I think it helps the members to appreciate what it is that we're doing when we're opening and closing the lodge where we're creating this sort of sacred space and we're, we're casting out the profane aspects of our lives and we're creating this beautiful space within which we can enjoy ourselves for an hour or so uh, before we have to return to that profane space. And I really do believe that music helps, just like sense and, and visual stimulation, they help us <laughs> to kind of center ourselves around exactly what it is that we're doing. And I think if you don't have that music, there's just this sort of a silence and maybe people are chatting on the sidelines and, and you know, not really focusing on what it is that we're doing. And I think the music really uh, pulls us all together into that sacred space. And, and I've since seen other lodges in the district doing the same thing. And that always makes me grin because I think they're copying us, but I, I think it's wonderful that we've done something that they thought worthy of emulation. Great, thank you for sharing. Yes, brothers, get some nice speakers, connect it up to someone's Bluetooth on their phone with a little playlist and hit play and it, it can do wonders for, for your launch. All right, um, Brother Steve, fast, a fantastic presentation. Thank you again for your time and preparing this. We appreciate it very much. We're going to move on and we'll play your song right before we close. Any other final comments that you want to make, Steve? Yeah, just on the piece, Jerry has it set up for about the last two minutes. You're going to find one of the most striking endings of any piece ever composed. And remember, it's specifically written for a funeral of his two friends that were Masons. And at the end, you'll hear these striking chords. Silence, chord, silence, and you'll hear this. And then the final chord is a huge surprise. And uh, is Brother Bizzik still on there? That he can, he can tell us, yep. uh, tell him what the big surprise is at the end. Uh, it's called a uh, Picardy third, a uh, major note chord. He hit it right on. What it is, it's a French word and it means pointed. And it basically just takes the semitone or half step and moves it from minor up a half step to major. And it seems so simple, but it's it's like the heavens have opened and the way that Mozart arranges and sets it. The first time I heard it, I cried. And it, it's so striking. I want you just to really be aware of that ending that's once in a lifetime ending. Great. Thank you very much. All right, brothers, we're going to move on and prepare to close. Next month, our presenter will be Brother Antonio Montica. <coughs> his presentation will be on his, his experience, uh, his new journey experience through the three degrees. He's a relatively new, newly raised Master Mason. Uh, and he's written a paper and he's going to be providing that and discussing that with us at our next meeting, which is October 26th, I believe. I have that on an upcoming slide. So look forward to having you there. Also want to make everyone aware who may not be already that 
The Rubicon Masonic Society is preparing to publish a book of transactions, volume one, um, and these will be available soon. We'll be sure to let everyone know uh, on how you can get those. It's uh, actually, Worship Brother John, would you mind just giving a brief summary of what, what they could expect? Uh, yes, there's uh, uh, essays written by Rubicon members and some who aren't members that will be in the transactions. It's in uh, formatting production right now and should be available sometime within the next, uh, we hope, four to six weeks. Great. Thank you. I also want to make everyone aware that the Masonic Table documentary is still available on and will continue to be available on Amazon Prime. We also recently came up and printed some DVDs. Uh, those are primarily for local Masons. If you are interested in a physical DVD, just reach out to one of us personally. We'll see what we can do to do that. Uh, and everything and all those updates can be found on the MasonicTable.com. For those of you that have seen it uh, and shared your expression and thanks, we appreciate it very much. So thank you. Uh, and we do actually have um, in the works the possibility of a second documentary coming up. So without giving any spoilers, I won't share what that is or what that could be. But we are strongly working hard on trying to come up with the next documentary of sorts. So we appreciate your continued support um, of that goal. Are there any final comments from anyone here tonight from William Aware, Rubicon, Lexington, or any other guests? Hearing none. If anyone here would like to help contribute to the Rubicon Masonic Society, we are a nonprofit and uh, contributions may be tax deductible. And you can find the information there on your screen, rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash donate. Worship Brother Alan Martin, would you please do the honors of delivering our closing prayer? Brothers, friends, uh, let's pray. As we part company, Grand Architect of the Universe, and may we keep in our minds that we are still together in spirit and in purpose. We work for your great purposes through masonry, so grant us the necessary strength, wisdom, and courage to continue our efforts with enthusiasm and creativity. May your love be the guide in our thoughts and our actions now and throughout our lives. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. So I'm going to be. Brothers, thank you again for joining us. Our next meeting will be on October 24th, not the 26th, October 24th, 7 p.m. Uh, feel free to invite others to participate, rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash RSVP. Brother Jerry, take it away with our closing song, please, whenever you're ready. Steve, thank you again. Good night, brothers.
Good night, brother. Good night. <clears throat> Be healthy, safe.